go in Jesus' name. Does the place you're called to labor seem so small and little known? It is great if God is in it and will not forsake his own. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you'll go in Jesus' name. Are you delayed aside from service, body worn from toil and care? You can still be in the battle, in the sacred place of prayer. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it. If you'll go in Jesus' name. Let's take a moment this afternoon to greet one another. Stay in your spots. There's lots of us. Just shake the hand of the person next to you or behind you. here is ended and our race on earth is run you can say if we are faithful welcome home my child well done little is much when God is in it labor not for wealth or fame there's a crown and you can win it if you'll go in Jesus name Amen. You may be seated, Pastor. Glory to God. That sounds amazing. I think we're going to have a whole service just of singing like that. Wow, that was amazing. If you have an extra seat available right now, raise your hand if there's anything next to you. There's one there. There's one there. There's one here. If you need a seat, you can grab them. There's a couple of open seats over here. Every seat in the house is going to be filled. And I know we have overflow. Thank you all for being here. We have, we have a lot of people here today. So we have, uh, of course, Wooden Valley, our sending church. Thank you for coming. We have Bellevue Baptist, the first church we started. We have Pastor AJ and uh, Emerald City Baptist. And then we have other churches and pastors here as well. Uh, there's, there's a lot of people here today. We've got former members from as far away as Montana. Great to have the popes here. And at friends from as far away as Florida, you punk, you came in here and surprised me. I'm going to ask Pastor Tim. Pastor Tim Schellberger is uh, one of the closest uh, men in my life and ministry. I count him one of my dearest friends. And I'm going to stop talking about it. I'll start crying. But he flew all the way out here just to be with us today. And uh, I want you to... <laughs> I want you to open a word of prayer. Thank Amen. You. Sure is good to be here. Aren't you glad to see God's faithfulness? What a blessing and how God provides, how God leads, and it just so much to rejoice in. And man, I'm glad for friendships and to see what God's done. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for your goodness, for your faithfulness, and uh, an event like this just to remind us, remind us, God, that you're still on the throne and you're always good. And uh, thank you, Lord, for the faithfulness. Uh, that you've blessed here with, with Pastor Roy and Pastor Matt and the paths that have crossed and how you've used um, both these men. And God, and now uh, um, 
boy, what a, what a great time to rejoice with them and to see what you've done here. So, Lord, as the, the, the service here uh, goes on and progresses, Lord, as you would see fit to bless the, the preaching, the continued singing, the fellowship we get to have, uh, God, we're, we're so overwhelmed with your goodness all of the time, and we say thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 What a day. I just, I can't quit beaming. We're going to have so much fun today. Today we celebrate the union of our two churches, the retirement of Pastor Roy. There's a lot of things happening today, and you are here to enjoy that with us. We're thrilled about that. This church started in 1900, and this is the original building, which is incredible. There's so much faith and life has passed through uh, this place, and we get to celebrate that. So we chose songs that would be brand new to the history of this church. The next two songs came out in 1884 and 1885, uh, which were pretty much brand new when this church started. Think about that. That's crazy. Uh, but the song we sang first, Little Is Much, that's, that's like our unofficial theme song for the past 17 years for foundation. But we're going to sing next, How Firm a Foundation, 1884. Let's come and sing. Let's all stand, How Firm a Foundation. How firm a foundation, 529 on the first. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid to your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said? Turn to our next song, 300, 365, How Great Thou Art, what an amazing song, sing out on that chorus, O Lord my God. O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder. Thank you. 
God, <laughs> wow, you can be seated. 124 years ago, they were singing that song right here in this church. Wow, glory to God, that's amazing. Oh, when Christ shall come, it's coming sooner than you think. Wow, well, I'm gonna ask Pastor Joel Creekmore. Joel and his, come on up, Pastor Joel and his family uh, were some of the first to join our church. They joined uh, a year after uh, we started the church, but even within that year, they were coming down and helping us out as often as they possibly could. And then finally, the Lord gave them liberty to join, and uh, they became, uh, he became my right-hand man and one of our hardest workers. And I hope to keep them forever, but God had other plans and started working on Joel's life, and he kept on asking for more and asking for more. And then finally, it just came to the point where it was like, you need the pastor. So we sent Joel out uh, whew, to start a church. <laughs> I just can't look at you. <clears throat> we sent him out to start a church, uh, Bellevue Baptist Church. And now it's an independent church and they're on their own and they've got people here that they've reached. And what we've begun has begun to reproduce itself and I thought it would be appropriate to ask Pastor Joel to come and pray for our offering. So Joel, come and pray for us. You know, I was thinking, I don't want to look at my wife because I'm a sympathetic crier, okay? So, but then, you know, you got Matt and uh, it's, uh, it's wonderful to be here though. It is, it is so good. I mean, this is our first time, my first time here. And uh, man, just hearing uh, the singing and just knowing what today means, so now I'm gonna start crying, uh, is, is wonderful. It's, uh, it's truly wonderful. And um, I was just thinking, you know, uh, 
it was, it was fun for us, but probably not for you when we would have foundation join us at Bellevue because you had no home, right? And uh, I mean, those were good times. We get to see you guys, but uh, you know, it's just the, you guys ha have a home now and uh, be able to reach, you know, Preston and the surrounding community and Sammamish and Fall City and all that. That's, that's so wonderful. Why don't we go ahead and just uh, go to the Lord uh, and ask for his blessing and, and just thank him, pray for the offering. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you. And just everything that today represents your faithfulness, uh, your grace, your goodness. And we are, are so grateful. But I'm also grateful for a church that uh, just stuck with it. And uh, regardless of not having a place to meet, um, just the, the challenges that they faced and and even just thinking about uh, Raging River and Preston Baptist Church and just sticking with it. It's so, so wonderful what we're able to celebrate here today. And Lord, we know it's because of you. We know that you are the giver of every blessing. And so Lord, we ask that you would receive this offering and that you would bless it and continue to do your work through it. And that we would see souls saved, that we would see churches started, missionaries sent, and uh, that through it all, you would be glorified. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good. <clears throat> Time 
games replay and I can see that I've cried some bitter tears but I felt his arms around me as I faced my greatest fears you see I've had more gains than losses and I've known more joy than hurt as his grace rolled down upon me undeserved God's been good in my life I feel blessed beyond my wildest dreams when I go to sleep each night and though I've had my share of hard times by my side he's always stood cause through it all friend his love was my beginning his love will be my end I could spend forever trying to tell you everything he is but the best way I can say it is this God's been good in my life I feel blessed beyond my wildest dreams when I go to sleep each night and though I've had my share of hard times by my side he's always stood cause through it all God's been good Amen. Not just a pretty song, but a truth that you can take to the bank. God's been good. Man, that was beautiful. Thank you, Alyssa. We have had the privilege of having Al and Helga Bonikowski in our church for quite some time now, retired missionaries to uh, Spain, and he was there 43 years. You guys were there 43 years. And so I've asked him to come uh, as a member of our church to lead us in a time of worship. And I know we have multiple churches here, so I don't know how... Everybody else does it, but before the preaching comes, we take a time where we introduce worship and then just a moment of silence while the piano plays while we bow before the Lord and worship Him. So I'm going to ask Al to come and introduce that worship and then we'll pray. These 85 years do not forgive. <laughs> I also do not trust my memory, so I have a, just a few thoughts for our time of worship this morning. For quite some time now, we've been uh, studying the book of Nehemiah in our Sunday morning services. Some 140 years after the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians, Nehemiah, who was not a preacher, he was a layman, is led of God to go back from captivity in Susa. Interesting city, Susa, Persia. That's the same town as the book of Esther. And today, the town of Shu'ush, Shu'ush in modern Iran. And he went to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And he did it in 52 days. I'm a carpenter. <laughs> and I do with wood and nails and lumber, but bricks and blocks of stone. In 52 days, when people are shooting at you, more or less, uh, he had a bunch of enemies while he was doing that. Amazing. And it called for 
a celebration, but a very different kind of celebration. They built a pulpit of wood, first time mention of a pulpit in the Bible. And then Ezra, who was a scribe, read from the Bible, the Pentateuch, for some five to six hours. I took my Bible and marked it in here, and that's the Pentateuch, okay? I know that it was a scroll or whatever it was, but in our understanding, that's what he was reading. And I don't know how long it would take you to read that, but uh, he read for between five to six hours as far as I understand. So just a few verses from there, Nehemiah chapter 8, verses, uh, I think it's 5 and 6, and Ezra opened the book. That part, that's what they had. He opened the book, their Bible, in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up, and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen. Amen. Amen, with lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshiped. They celebrated by worshiping. Worship the Lord with their faces to the ground. Today we are celebrating the joining of our two churches into one. So let's spend a few moments in worship as we join our two churches. Father, what a wonderful privilege it is to be a child of yours, to be able to see your hand of grace at work in ways we could never have imagined. And Father, to be able to bring us to a place like this today is truly a miracle, truly a blessing from you. But Father, as we come to a time in your word, we ask that you would just open it up as I often pray. Father, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to understand what it is you want to say to us today. And Father, as I have opportunity to share, may uh, I not get in the way of anything that you desire to say. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight today. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer, we commit this time to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Whew. Last year, at this time, I preached a series of messages about prayer. In that series of messages about prayer uh, that I titled Praying Dangerously, I, prayed four di I preached four different messages about praying dangerously. Three of the titles were, Lord, Search Me, Lord, Send Me, and Lord, Shape Me. During that last message of Lord Shape Me, I used the text from Jeremiah 18 that says this. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. 
At that time, I, I remember sharing about the role of the potter, the role of the wheel, and the role of the clay. And I made the point that God is the, the master potter, and that the wheel are the circumstances in our lives, and the clay represents us. To that end, as clay, we need to be, make ourselves available to God to shape us and adjust us as he deems best. I bring that up because in the last few months, one of the big questions that I have been asked has to do with my future upon my retirement from full-time vocational ministry. What complicates this discussion is that after living in church-provided housing for over 21 years and living in one of the most expensive regions in the country, the question becomes is where are we going to live? Shirley and I are thankful and grateful for the, the time that we are allowed to grant it that to live here while we look for housing and what our next steps might be. And for a person like me who likes to be in control of all things and know what's happening at all times, this is a time of letting go and saying to God, God, shape me. God, shape me and direct me as you deem best. I kind of feel like clay on the potter's wheel, saying, Father, shape me, mold me into the image that you desire, whatever that looks like. And even with that in mind, this last Tuesday, I was reading from the devotional book, My Utmost for His Highest, by Oswald Chambers, and the reading for that day just ministered deeply to me right at the point of my need. He wrote in this devotional that he titled, Will You Go Out Without Knowing? The text he was writing from says this, that he went out not knowing where he was going. And this is what it said in that devotional. Have you ever gone out in this way? If so, there is no logical answer possible when anyone asks you what you are doing. One of the most difficult questions to answer in Christian work is, what do you expect to do? You don't know what you're going to do. The only thing you know is that God knows what he is doing. Continually examine your attitude toward God to see if you are willing to go out in every area of your life, trusting in God entirely. It is this attitude that keeps you in constant wonder because you don't know what God is going to do next. Each morning as you wake, there is a new opportunity to go out, building your confidence in God. Just as it says in Luke 20, 12, 22, do not worry about your life nor your body. In other words, he says, don't worry about the things that concerned you before you did, before you went out. And he goes on to say this, have you been asking God what he's going to do? He will never tell you. God does not tell you what he's going to do. He reveals to you who he is. Do you believe in a miracle working God? And you will go out to complete surrender to him until you are not surprised one iota by anything he does? He finishes up by saying this, Believe God is always the God you know him to be when you are nearest to him. Then think how unnecessary and disrespectful worry is. Let the attitude of your life be a continual willingness to go out in dependence upon God and your life will have a sacred and inexpressible charm about it that is very satisfying to Jesus. And he finishes up by saying this, You must learn to go out through your convictions, creeds, or experiences until you come to the point in your faith where there is nothing between yourself and God. I share that with you to ask you to pray. Pray for us as we transition from here to wherever it is that God desires for us to be or wherever he desires for us to go. But today, we are here to celebrate what God has done in bringing two congregations together and be united as one congregation. Not only that, but I am here to affirm and to charge Pastor Matt Farinella as the pastor of this one congregation. I will do that symbolically in a moment by passing the shepherd's staff from me to him. Why a shepherd's staff, you might want to ask? Well, in an article written by John W. Rittenbaugh, he wrote this about a shepherd's staff. He said, most frequently the staff is used in three ways. 
The first is drawing sheep together into an intimate relationship. This is of special interest during a lambing season because in a large flock there are often dozens or scores of lambs being born at the same time. It's easy for the ewe to lose her lamb in all the confusion. The little shepherd has to make sure the right lamb gets to the right ewe. For those who have just a few sheep, that would be no problem. But when there are hundreds and sometimes thousands of ewes in one flock, the staff becomes very important. As much as he is able, the shepherd watches the lambs being born. Then, if there is any confusion at all between the lamb and the ewe, he uses his staff to hook the lamb around the neck, through the body, a very daft maneuver, he says. Picks up the lamb by the staff, carries it to the proper ewe. He cannot touch the lamb. If he touches the lamb, the ewe will not suckle, and because there is a wrong odor, the smell of the man, and the ewe fears it too much, it will not feed it. These are the lambs that one may see people feeding with a bottle. The staff, then, is used to bring the lamb into an intimate relationship with its ewe. Secondly, the staff is used to reach out and grab a lamb for close inspection. In this way, it frequently precedes the passing under of the rod. The shepherd hooks it by the neck or leg and leads it to where he will examine it. And thirdly, the staff is used in guiding the sheep as they are moving along because sheep tend to wander off. They always think the pasture is greener somewhere else and they start to wander away. The whole flock will be going one way, but there will be one that leads or heads in her own direction. Finally, he says the shepherd will frequently use the blunt end to jab the sheep in the ribs and nudge it back in the direction of the flock. You see, the shepherds are the, the flock's first line of defense against danger. We read in the Bible that David risked his life by taking on a, a lion and a bear single-handedly to protect, protect his sheep. And he won. And when the sheep got lost, the shepherd will scour the hills to find it. You see, shepherds care for the injured. They assist in lambing and constantly watch for strays. Shepherds lead their flocks to fresh grasslands and water to keep them well nourished. And even with that said, it is not missed on what the responsibility of the shepherd of a local assembly is to be either. A pastor must take his charge seriously and soberly and understanding the great responsibility he possesses. As I shared last Sunday in a message that I entitled From the Heart of a Grateful Pastor, I shared in that message that it's about six qualities that a pastor of a local church needs to possess as he leads the congregation. And I just wanted to go over those briefly with you. The first one is this, that pastor must be passionately pursuing the priority of prayer. In 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 4, we read these words. He says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving, and giving thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come to, to come unto the knowledge of truth. Friends, you need to understand something. This is not my idea of a top priority. From what I read, it is God's top priority. Paul writes to Timothy, I exhort therefore that first of all, Prayer must not only be the priority in the life of a pastor, but everyone else, every other Christ follower. Prayer is the opportunity for each of us to develop an intimate, personal, one-on-one -on -one relationship with God himself. Clearly, God did this, Jesus did this throughout his ministry, and it follows that the pastor must do the same. Second, a pastor needs to be affirming the authority of the Almighty. Friends, God has given us this book right here. He's given us this book to unequivocally present to us that he's in control of everything. Every little detail in every person's life. It's God's alignment tool. It's God's perfect standard and the shepherd's job is to make sure that each of us understands that what must be adjusted 
that they may be adjusted and this doesn't need to be adjusted. And we need to adjust our dislikes or our likes to what is written in here. God's authority is clearly spelled out on the words in our Bible. And it is the responsibility of the pastor, frankly every believer, to live by the standards and the truths that are laid out in our Bible. Our responsibility is to be obedient at all costs to the truths that are contained in our Bibles. A pastor should be working on developing a passionate love relationship with Jesus that's based on obedience to what is written in the Bible. And that only takes place through obedience and recognition of who is in control. A third thing a pastor needs to be doing is living. How he should be living is by serving sacrificially and selflessly. We can never forget that he is serving an audience of one. And he is following the example of that same one. We are serving Jesus first and foremost. And he needs to be serving others as if he was serving Jesus. A fourth thing a pastor needs to be doing is triumphantly teaching truth. You see, truth is a person. And his name is Jesus. A pastor is to be joyfully, cheerfully, and relevantly teaching about Jesus everywhere he goes. Whether it's in the counseling office, at home, at the coffee shop, or in the pulpit, he needs to be a man of truth. The pastor's role is to help equip the flock so that the body may be built up and effective for God's work. However, he cannot do that if he's not spending time assimilating and learning about truth in his own life. A fifth thing a pastor needs to be passionate about is this. He needs to be obsessed with outreach to others. He needs to remember pastors are called to plant and water. It's God who brings the harvest and the increase. A pastor's heart must be broken over the folks in his community or his ministry. Those that don't have no Jesus. His heart must be broken every day over that reality. There's no room for indifference when it comes to eternity. You see, there's only two conclusions after death, one is spent with Jesus forever in heaven, and the other is spent in eternity, in, in eternity away from him in hell. A pastor must be obsessed with outreach, not only in this, his community, but the needs to ha- he needs to have a worldwide view of the need of folks around the world. And my last point is this, that a pastor must recognize the requirement of relationships with others. He cannot be a lone stranger. He needs relationships with people in the seats as well as people behind the pulpit. We need one another. We need to be living out the one another commands in Scripture. Commands like accepting one another, admonishing one another, being kind to one another, being compassionate to one another, encouraging one another, bearing with one another, greeting one another, loving one another, and the other 69 other one another commands in Scripture. We need one another and we are better together than we are apart. And much of what takes place in a pastor's life is behind the scenes. Like in living rooms or restaurants or workplaces or backyard barbecues. It's in the midst of life's routines and its most grueling crises the questions of life come up. Questions like, why did this happen to me, pastor? I'm afraid, what should I do? How can I become more of a real Christian? Or how can I fight this battle in my life? A question often comes up is, what do pastors do on days other than Sunday? I'm glad you all asked that same question, I guess. Well, they look for sheep who are wandering. Sheep who live as to say, our family is too busy for God. Sheep who are too, so dull to know that God is for real and that life only comes once. He's looking for sheep who do not know that the good shepherd poured out his lifeblood to rescue them. Sheep who are lying hurt and hurting, waiting for someone to care, someone to notice, someone to bring them wholeness, to find them before they die alone. Friends, that is what a pastor does. They care for sheep. And we count it a privilege to be in relationship with our flock. You see, leading 
one of Jesus' churches as a pastor shepherd is a great privilege. Few things excite pastors more than seeing people come to know Jesus and then seeing those who know Jesus grow in their relationship with him. Listen, if I, if I were to distill this all down, it could be reduced to three charges that I'm about now to give to Pastor Matt when I hand him this staff here in a moment. First charge, Pastor Matt, I give you is this. Is feed the flock. In 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through 4, we read these words. The elders which are among you I exhort... Who am I, also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed? Feed the flock, the flock of God which is among you, taking the, over, think, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as uh, being lords over God's heritage, but being an example to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, we shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Pastor Matt, I charge you to feed the flock. Amen. Second thing that I charge you, Pastor Matt, is this. Preach the word. In 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 5, it says this. I charge thee, therefore, before our God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all loving, long-suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. But watch thou, watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Pastor Matt, I charge you to preach the word. A third charge is this, Pastor Matt, is protect the flock. Acts 20, verses 28 through 31 says this. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves. And to all the flock over to which the Holy Spirit hath made you overseers. To feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you. Not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn every night, every one night and day with tears. So Pastor Matt, I charge you to protect the flock. I'm going to invite you, Pastor Matt, to come on up and take this shepherd's staff from me. But before we give it to you, I'm going to invite all of the trustees from Foundation Baptist and all the pastors of the planted churches and Pastor Rich to come on up here. We're going to pay, pray for Pastor Matt I'll start with prayer, and Pastor Rich uh, Farinella, Matt's dad, is going to close our time in prayer. So why don't you come on over here, Pastor Matt. We're going to lay our hands on you. We'll slap you upside the head. How's that sound? <laughs> All right, guys. Let's pray for him. All right, put your right there you go. Oh, Father, what a privilege it is to stand here uh, with Pastor Matt. And, Father, I thank you for his integrity. I thank you for his love for you his love for people, his love for this community. And Father, as he takes on this responsibility, I just pray that you would use him in ways that are beyond his wildest imagination, that he may bring you much glory and much praise. May Foundation Baptist Church be used by you to make a difference in this community. May this community be different because Foundation is here. And then Father, we want to set them aside for your purposes and your work. I pray for protection for Matt and his family and his marriage, that, Father, you would do a mighty work that only you can do in them, through them, and around them, all for the praise of your glory. We thank you for the privilege of being able to stand with him today to encourage him, to pray for him, to let him know that we love him. We love you much, Jesus, in your name. Lord, as we continue to pray, I just want to say thank you for... Matt's faithfulness, and I pray that you would continue to just bless him with faithfulness as I'm sure new challenges will arise. 
and that uh, you would just continue to grow him in the wisdom that he has already received of you, but just that he would continue, and, and uh, Lord, that you would just do great and amazing things through just his pastorship here and the church here. Pray for his family again, and safety, and, and just as uh, the desire for things to continue and grow, I just pray that uh, you would help him to have it be done in your time and, and just, uh, just be able to glorify you in everything that is done. We thank you, Lord, and ask this in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for the example that men like me get to look up to and men like Pastor Matt and his, his faithfulness to this church, to his family, to, to, to train up the next generation and his patience that I've experienced, Lord, as he's invested his life in me. And uh, Lord, looking forward, I know that there will be challenges, that there will be continual resistance as we, as we uh, wrestle not with flesh and blood. Lord, this is a battle, and I pray that you would continue to protect, continue to guide, and surround Pastor Matt with those of us who love him and, and new people that will come along who can stand by his side and sometimes lift up his hands when he's heavy, mm -hmm. and lift up his hands when he's yeah. discouraged, Lord, because he's done that for us. He's done that for me. I just thank you and I love them. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> Dear God, as we close in prayer, we thank you so much for this day. And as Pastor Roy mentioned, there's greater things that we can do together. And Lord, thank you so much that we are able to be in a place to see folks join together and, and send out a greater light in this area and, and establish a lighthouse as it has been and to continue. Lord, thank you. What a wonderful thing. I'm reminded of the verse, uh, hope deferred maketh the heart sick, but when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. And Lord, we all rejoice. We celebrate because of you establishing these two churches that are merging that will be uh, uh, effective and shining out the light here in this area. Lord, what a, what a wonderful thing, a dream, a, a blessing to see your, your blessing upon this place and upon the gospel to go forth. And Lord, we do pray for Pastor Matt. We thank, that, thank you for him. And I thank you personally, Lord, for everything that you've given me through him and in him. Lord, it's just been such a joy to see that. And I'm so proud to see my son to mm -hmm. stand and to, and to preach your word and to, and to be a good pastor as was preached. Lord, thank you for that message. And thank you for the word of God that gives us uh, direction and guidance. Lord, I pray that you'd be with Matt. Help him to, to uh, be everything that he needs to be here for this place and for this community, for these people, for his family. Lord, I pray that you just uh, have your hand of blessing and protection to be upon him. Lord, we we thank you and we rejoice together. These churches and these saints together rejoice together in what you're doing right here in this place, in this building. Lord, we, we thank you and we, we uh, uh, celebrate the, the events that are taking place. Lord, we want to tell you that we love you, Lord, for being such a great God and, and, and so uh, uh, powerful and bountiful and you, pr you provide everything that we need. Lord, I pray that you just continue to be that God to us and help us to be faithful to you. And Lord, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I was talking to another pastor here, Pastor Nate, and uh, talking about how the merger went. These all don't always work well, as you might be aware. But he asked me how it's gone, and I said, it's gone great because of Pastor Roy. I cannot think of another man uh, to do this with. You've made it a joy and uh, set a great example for me. Just really grateful for that. Thank you. Thank 
Whew. Thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness for 21 years. But I want you to know, I'm not the only one who'd like to thank you today. And you have a church that has loved on you. And uh, the only thing that's made it hard for me to come is for you to go. And they're, they're not super excited about that because you're loved. And I want to recognize that. First, Pastor Roy, I'd like to present this to you. If you would make a mind coming up. Uh, the people of this church just put this Bible together. It says, this holy Bible is presented to a faithful shepherd by a grateful flock. And it has the signatures of those in the church letting you know that we love you and we appreciate what you've Thank done you for so us. As any good pastor would know, though, uh, it is not simply a pastor uh, who uh, the church needs. It's the pastor's wife, and no pastor makes it without a good wife. Surely, you have been the support and the love and the comfort that your husband has needed. I know he could not have made it without you. And this church would like to express its love to you with some roses and a gift card to go pamper yourself. <laughs> Pastor Roy, I would like to ask you to come up here one more time. Uh, when we began thinking about this process, uh, back in the early summer, I presented an opportunity to the church. I said, you know, when this finally comes, I would like to be a blessing to you. Now we've already done retirement stuff and all that, but we wanted to be a personal blessing to you and give you and Shirley a love offering. And back then... I offered to the church, I said, we would be willing as foundation to match up to $10,000 of what Raging River gave. They, they not only matched that, they far exceeded that. And I'd like to present you with this check for $31,500. <laughs> Amen. Exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or think. Praise the Lord for that. We want you to know how much you're loved. And you know what? All that is nothing compared to the value you have meant to the Lord for all eternity. I can't wait. When we get to heaven, we get to see, we all get to see the reward of serving him. And there's nothing compared to that. It's appropriate now. We're going to take some time and reflect a little bit on the history of these two churches coming together in a video we've put together. You've heard the final charge from Pastor Roy. And after the video, I will give essentially the first charge uh, of this pastor. So let's watch the video and enjoy a little bit of what the Lord has done over the years. Give ear, O oh my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children. The sawmill for Preston was at Upper Preston, and the, it was huge trees that were what 12 feet across some of them and uh, they were logged up there mostly and then rough cut shipped down to Preston which is about two and a half miles
was sold first was shingles and shake for all the homes being built in Seattle. A lot of the houses in Seattle and all around were, had Preston shake, uh, shingles. Showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. August Lovgren was, uh, had become a Baptist in Sweden. And when he uh, built the mill, he donated the lumber to build, have the church built. So the men of the community built the church. It was the hub of the community because uh, they sponsored every all the community things pretty much. And my mother and dad were the first ones married in the church in 1901. They had come, my dad had come in 1898 and my mother came in 1899 and they met here in Preston and were married then. In, in the church on a New Year's Eve. Which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. By the grace of God, unlike many old churches of this time that have long since closed its doors, this little Baptist church in Preston has flourished over the years, reaching many people for Christ. As the church grew through the years and served its community, the need for updates and changes have arisen many times over and over in the last 20, 124 years. And each time change was needed, the good people of this church have stepped out of their comfort zone, rolled up their sleeves, and answered the call that they might stay effective at reaching people for Christ. As a result of this mission-driven spirit, God has blessed this church with a history of spiritual fruit whose eternal impact may never be known on this side of eternity. And I'm just thankful that Shirley and I have been able to spend the last 21 years of our lives serving God from this location, all for the glory of God. That the generation to come might know them even the children which should be born. I'll never forget moving from the Midwest in 1985 so my parents could plant a church here in Washington State. The faith they had to face the unknown for the cause of Christ to me was incredible. I am in the ministry today because of my parents' passionate love for God, their incredible faith, and their tenacious, never quit spirit. I had a front row seat in watching them plant a church. So when life came full circle and I came on staff at my dad's church to plant the first church out of Wooden Valley, I had just enough information to be dumb enough to think I knew what I was doing. We had nearly 50 helpers that day from our sending church to help us with the with the crowd, <laughs> but the only visitors that came as a result of our advertising efforts were my neighbor, his wife, and their granddaughter. But it was a start, and by the grace of God, those three became our first members. That first year was extremely hard and slow, but little by little, many firsts began to follow. We had our first baptism, our first Bible study at my home, our first soul saved and baptized, and by the end of the first year, we had about 20 people. Even with our nursery in the chair closet and our kids' classes in the kitchen, the church began to grow one step at a time. We took on our first missionaries and had special days and revival meetings and vacation Bible schools and community outreach events. 
until the day finally came four years later when we were ready to officially charter Foundation Baptist Church. What an exciting day in Sammamish, Washington because of the official birthing of Foundation Baptist Church. And we have so many folks that still talk about the great times that we had while the Farinellas were on staff at Bible Baptist Church. So congratulations. I hope you make it a special day and that it's just the beginning of all that God has envisioned and has given your pastor a heart for so you can reach the community of Sammamish. Congratulations and enjoy your special day. One thing I've learned from church planning over the past 17 years is that you have to be flexible enough to adapt to your environment, uh, creative enough to use whatever you have available, and crazy enough to have fun while doing it. Though the past 17 years have been filled with great memories, it hasn't been easy. Within six months of starting, we had our first Vision Sunday and framed the first dollar of our building fund in this little frame. But in all that time, we were never able to get a place to call our own. Over the years, we have met in log cabin lodges, homes of members, countless rental facilities, even one where we couldn't wear shoes in the building that was odd. We met in city hall, in university classrooms, in gymnasiums, picnic shelters, and even a McDonald's dining room. Not having a place of our own to put down roots was not the only hardship. There were some pretty dark days along the way. Besides my wife's personal battle with cancer, there have been countless financial hardships to overcome, opposition from within and without, and all of this while trying to plan a church in a godless Northwest culture that would just as soon have nothing to do with God at all. At some point, you have to stop and ask yourself, why keep going? Why do it at all? That's when you have to remember the incredible works God allowed you to be a part of. I would choose this life a thousand times over just for the privilege of leading some more lost souls to Christ, of baptizing a believer, of growing them into disciples and seeing them walk with God. There's nothing like preaching the word and seeing people's lives change through the power of God. There's nothing like planting a new church where, uh, whether that's in Bellevue or Seattle or Finley and seeing this whole process reproduce itself. Yes, there have been hardships, but it has all been worth it. And yet, there is one greater reason still to keep sacrificing and serving and sharing what God has done. And that's simply this, the Lord's work is not done with us. 
who should arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. The next generation needs to see the Lord at work today in our lives so that they will set their hope in him. They need to see for themselves what God can do. That every generation to follow might learn from our example. to walk with God and serve him and keep his commandments. from our trio here, and then we will continue with the service. Saves, we'll proclaim 
shine. Amen. Praise the Lord. We'll hold up the light. That, that ought to be a great signal. We're not ending anything. We're just beginning. 124 years is just a drop in the bucket for all eternity. And who knows how much time we have left. We may have another 124 years before the Lord returns. So we need to hold up the light. Thank you for that. Now I know what time it is. And I know you've already got one message in. As Pastor Roy gave his final charge, I'd like to give... The first charge. I'll be aware of the time if you can turn to Psalm 78. Psalm 78. I do ask for your prayer. I've had not had a voice pretty much at all till approximately this morning. So I hope I can hold on to this. <clears throat> Though I have preached many times from this pulpit in the past nine months, uh, in some ways, as I said, this, me this message represents my first charge to the church. <clears throat> what has been handed to me, what has been handed us today, represents an awesome privilege and responsibility. It really does. There's an incredible history here that needs to be remembered and built upon. Amen? Amen. Incredible things have happened here. I can't believe some of the pictures they had from way back when, 124 years ago. Over, over 6,400 Sundays have been held right here in this building. People worshiping the Lord. That's incredible. And that history needs to be built upon. And at the same time, this day reflects an incredible responsibility for the future and what lies before us. For this reason, I've asked the Lord for help and knowing what to say. I asked him to give me the words to say. This is uh, an important moment, and I believe he gave them to me, gave them to us right here in the first seven verses of Psalm 78. You already saw a little bit on the screen. The Bible says this, Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. <clears throat> that the ch generation to come might know them, even the children what should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray for the message here that you would, first of all, Lord, just be with my voice. Give me the strength to speak and bless the preaching of your word. Let its truths uh, come through in Jesus' name. Amen. After reading these opening lines of Psalm 78, I believe Asaph the writer of this psalm knew exactly how it felt to hold the past in one hand and the future in the other. That's what he wrote about. <clears throat> there, there's, uh, there, there's an incredible story here. A Asaph was the chief musician in the worship of the tabernacle under David's reign, just before the temple got to be built. I mean, he's, he's a prophet in his own right. He's a great leader. And he has some important words to say with the future in one hand and the past in the other. He was an extraordinary leader. And yet as Asaph wrote this psalm, he re reflected with reverence and wonder on all that had been handed to him by his forefathers in the faith. Asaph knew God, uh, knew God and understood how to worship him properly because his fathers in the faith, as it says in the passage, showed the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works which he hath done. That's how it always is. The things we learn, we didn't come up with them ourselves. We owe it to those who have gone before us. My pastor used to say in Stillwater, 
Oklahoma when I was on staff there. He said, if I've seen farther than other men, it is because I've stood on the shoulders of giants. And he got that from his dad, which I'm sure he got it from somewhere else. Because it's been true for all of history. The things we learn in life, we owe to those who've gone before, don't we? And here's Asaph. He's a godly man. I mean, he's, he's leading the most significant worship service uh, in the tabernacle under David, the greatest king of Israel outside of Jesus. And yet he's reflecting on the responsibility he has based on what's been handed to him. It's an awesome thought. Asaph had been given a precious gift and he was overwhelmed with gratitude and filled with a sense of responsibility to the former generations to pass their faith to the generations to come. He could not let what he had died with him. So the Bible says he opened his mouth in a parable. You read that with me. He opened his mouth in a parable about the history of his people. In other words, as he rehearses various chapters from the history of his nation, there's going to be some hidden meaning in there that he calls dark sayings of old, which have a deeper meaning, something that's not on the surface. So you can just kind of see Asaph at the beginning of this chapter. He says, everyone, listen up, listen up. I've got a story to tell you. I have a parable. I've got something to share. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about our history because history is important. But what's important is not simply the communication of the facts, but there's a truth underneath the history that you need to get. You see what I'm saying? He says, I've got a parable. I have some dark sayings to share with you. He's trying to help us learn a lesson from faith, from history. In fact, I think you would agree, our faith depends on what we learn from the past. And the future of those not yet born, as the passage says, depends on the lessons of faith we preserve for them. As I said in the video, I'm telling you, I am in the ministry today because of my parents. Not simply because they were in ministry. You might not know this, or maybe you do. There's an, uh, uh, an alarming amount of pastor's kids who never do anything with the ministry after they leave home based on what they saw. But I have had the opposite experience based on watching the faith of my mom and dad and their passion for the Lord and their dedication. It inspired me. If God would allow it, I would love to be in ministry and God allowed it. And I'm just trying to tell you, as you probably already know, you owe a lot to the past. You owe a lot to those who've gone before you and the things we have of our faith were given to us by someone who loved you. Amen, pastor. That's right. I'll encourage you on that because it's a truth. Help me out now. My voice is low. I need your help here. <laughs> we owe a lot to the past. Except the irony... <laughs> of what follows in the next 72 verses of this chapter. I don't know if you've read it before. It's not exactly the most pleasant chapter on the passage or on the history of Israel. It's a bunch of failure, in fact. Asaph shares from his nation's history things that are frankly not worth repeating. It's almost as if he's saying, we ought to remember history. Just don't repeat this. <laughs> we, ought, we ought to remember history and those have gone before. And now I'm going to share with you some stuff and don't do it. <laughs> it's, it's like a dad telling his kids, I don't care if I did it when I was your age. You're not going to do it. And, and here's Asaph and he's saying, listen, history is important. And I'm going to share with you some things. And none of these things are good. And so over the next 72 verses... What follows is Asaph reciting the disloyalty of the people of God in spite of the goodness of God. It's pretty sad. Asaph drew his lessons from the three great events in Israel's history. The exodus, the wilderness wanderings, and the conquering of Canaan. One thing's for sure. He did not look at the good old days with rose-colored glasses he, he presented a very bleak and unfortunate picture. And don't worry, we're not preaching 72 verses. I'm stopping at seven, okay? <clears throat> but he's recounting this. 
And, and what was Asaph's chief takeaway from the survey of his history? Well, he sums it up in two phrases. In the first half of this uh, recounting of history, he sums it up in verse 11 with this idea. They forgot God. And then when he gets to the second half of Israel's history, he sums up this part of the history with these words. They did not remember his hand. Well, that's a great way to summarize your history. They forgot God. They did not remember his hand. How do you forget God? Now, I know, look, I, we can all forget God. But let's just talk about Egypt. And I'm not going to recount. If you can give me some feedback and amens, then I will not recount all the verses that show how they forgot God in Israel. But they walked through Israel, or Israel, excuse me, in Egypt. And, and Pharaoh was dominating their life. And they were slaves. And they were making bricks and, and, and dying under the heat of the sun. Their children were being slaughtered. And then God sent Moses and Aaron and delivered them out of that and sent the ten plagues. And, 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 the, and the death angel that passed over and then they escaped by the parting of the Red Sea and walking through. I mean, how do you forget that? How, how do you forget that? And what about the wilderness wanderings? Did they forget how God gave them manna from heaven and quail and water when they needed it? Did they forget that the very presence of God was there in a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day and literally led them? Amen. How do you forget that? Excuse me? <laughs> How do you forget that? How do you forget when you get bit by serpents and you cry out to God and he, he, he puts a serpent on a rod in the middle of camp and says, look and live, and you look and live? How do you forget the wilderness wanderings? And Canaan? Do you really forget walking around a city for seven days, not saying a word, and then the final day you walk around and you shout and the walls come down? You forget that? What in the world is going on? And yet, that's what it says. They forgot God. In verse 32 through 39, summarizing this first half, it says, In spite of all of the proofs of God's love, their memories were painfully short, and they forgot him, and they were unfaithful. And, and as if to double down on the importance of remembering lessons from history, Asaph drives home his message in the last half of this chapter by repeating the exact same history over again. I don't feel bad about rabbit trails of preaching too long because Asaph got up and he literally re-preached the same thing in the second half of this chapter. He just repeated the same history from a different angle. Because it's shocking that they forgot God. It's amazing. It's incredible. At first glance, I bet, what, I bet you're coming to this conclusion as maybe I did. At first glance, it seems the lesson of this chapter... Sounds something like this. You've probably heard this before. If you don't learn from history, you're bound to repeat it. Kind of looks like that, doesn't it? it? It looks like that's what's happening. If you don't learn from history, you're bound to repeat it. Or repeat it. Have you ever noticed, though, <clears throat> we always refer to history repeating itself in a negative way? We always say that negatively. It, you don't learn from history, you're bound to repeat it. Now, I understand there's some negative things about history we don't want to repeat, but repeating history doesn't have to be a bad thing, does it? I mean, I remember David, and he recounted the story himself when facing Goliath. He said, I faced a bear, and I faced a lion, and God delivered me from that. I don't remember David saying, I sure hope history doesn't repeat itself. <laughs> no, he... It's not always a bad thing. It doesn't have to be a bad thing that history would repeat itself when we repeat the good stuff, right? I, I'm sure there's a lot of things we'd like to repeat. I, I'm sure after watching from August Lovegren on down, there have been a lot of historical things that have happened here that I'd love to repeat over and over and over again. See people saved and more people added to the church. More churches started, right? It seems like something we'd want to repeat. Yeah. Not everything in history ought to be forgotten. Some things ought to be remembered and repeated. But the problem is not that Israel didn't remember. For all of Israel's dismal failures, 
Its future still depended on repeating the right decisions. And here's where the deeper meaning of all this history talk comes into view. Remember what Asaph said at the beginning of this parable? He says, I'm going to tell you a parable. I'm going to utter dark sayings. And then he gives this crazy history. And you're like, well, what's the lesson? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because here's the lesson he's trying to communicate. In one way or another, history will repeat itself. So how do you repeat the good parts? That's, that's really the, the lesson here we want to get to. Yes, it's true. One way or another, history will repeat itself. But I'm interested in repeating the good parts. And I think you are too. I do, I, there are things I want to forget, but there's things I want to remember. And, and we can throw stones at Israel all day long. And look, it's easy. We can, we can mock them and say, how in the world could you forget the parting of the Red Sea and the manna and all that? But honestly, if we pulled this screen back down and we just showed your own thoughts over the past week. You think you'd stick around? This would be my first and last service as the new pastor. <laughs> I wouldn't stick around. It's easy to throw stones at them for not remembering God. But do you want all of your past to be remembered? Come on, no way. <laughs> no way. Are there parts of your past you would rather forget? <laughs> yeah, there's some of mine too. Have you always been faithful to God? No. no. So how do we repeat the good parts? How do we pass the good stuff on to the next generation? The problem with Israel, listen, the problem with Israel was not that they did not remember their history. As Asaph is writing, there's nobody reading his psalm thinking, what? We were in Egypt at one point? Nobody said that. Nobody's thinking, oh man, Asaph, I'm so glad you wrote this cool psalm because I had no idea we wandered through the wilderness. You mean to tell me this home that we're living in in this country was once occupied by the Canaanites and we overcame them? Had no idea. They knew. It, look, no, I, I'm just trying to say, it's not that Israel did not know its history, but they simply saw it as their story and not God's. When the Bible says they forgot God, it's not meaning they forgot everything that happened, but they forgot the part God played in it. Do you understand? There's a big difference. When history becomes our story, the only thing that gets repeated are the parts not worth remembering. What future generations need us to remember is not our story, but His. What people are going to need us to remember 10 years from now and 20 years from now and 124 years from now is not our story, but His. Do you understand? Listen, to see the past as our story leads us to think things like, this is the way it's always been. Listen, to see the future as our story leads us to think, well, we can do it better. Why would you think that way? Because it's our story. Do you understand what I'm saying? But to see our history as God's story leads us to think, look what God can do. Look, if you, there are two different ways to look at the past. You can look back and see what God has done, or you can look back and see, look at my story. It's either his story or it's your story. And I'm telling you, through the words of Asaph, he says, let me share you a parable from the history of Israel. It's not that they forgot the details. They just forgot whose story it was. And they accredited it to themselves. And they left God out of their thinking. And listen, you can get yourself into a big mess because the things that you'll remember are not worth remembering. It creates us this attitude of pride that says, well, this is the way things used to be, and I think they should always be this way because this is part of my story. And the younger generation comes along and says, well, I don't care what the older generation did. This is our story now, and we're going to do them this way, and this is the way it ought to be because we can do it better because it's our story. But the right attitude is it's not our story at all. And the parts of our story that exist, I hope, never get brought to light. The only thing worth knowing is God's story. It's His story. 
It's his story that ought to be remembered. It's his story that's, that's going to make any difference at all. And here we are. We're coming down to the end. I'm landing the plane. <laughs> I suppose you can see why this is an important text for us. There's a lot of history here. I mean, like, it's even silly to say it, it existed before I was born. It existed multiple times more before any of us were born. There's a lot of history here. And many people have played a part in it. Here's the question I'd like to ask for the members of Foundation Baptist Church and the church that exists here. I know we got lots of guests. You just get to listen in. But here's the question I'd like to ask. Are we going to look back and see our story or God's? If we are going to repeat the good parts, then we have to look back and focus on what God has done. That history is worth passing on to the next generation. No one ever suffered from pride in the past who acknowledged God did all the good parts. You understand? It's an important question, isn't it? Are we going to look back and see our story or God's? But there's another question. I believe there's a lot of history before us. I hope there is. So here's the question. Are we going to make the future about our story or God's? We're not going to be here long. If God doesn't return, what is life? It's gone like that. Why should we get so wrapped up in us? And the things we want to do, friend, we get to have, listen, oh, we get to have a part in God's story. That's enough for any man, woman, boy, or girl. So what, is, what will it be? Are we going to make this our story? Oh, this is a story of Foundation Baptist Church from here on out. No. No, that's not right. Because it was never about Foundation Baptist Church or Raging River Community Church in the first place. This is God's story. If we're going to live a life worth repeating for future generations, then we have to look to what God can do and place our hope in Him and not ourselves. That is a history worth passing on to the next generation. Asaph's parable is an important lesson for us today. History will repeat itself. But only the history worth, uh, uh, but the only history worth repeating is the one where God gets all the glory. Let me read to you those opening lines. He says once more, "Give ear, O my people, incline your ear to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children." Showing the generations to come. Listen. The praises of the Lord. And his strength. And his wonderful works that he hath done. It's all about him. That's a history worth repeating. Heavenly Father. As we bring these two churches together. We are humble servants who get to enter into your story. A story you began to write before the creation of the world. Lord, you prepared to die for us even back then. And you're still in the business of redeeming and using lives like ours. What a privilege to be a part of your story. Father, you have blessed this congregation for 124 years. If you tarry, will you bless it for another 124 to come? Bless it, Lord, with a focus on you. Let us live out your story 
and not our own. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm going to take a moment of invitation. I know there's not a lot of room to meet, to move around, but it's always important when truth has been delivered to give people an opportunity to do something with it. Friend, This is not a salvation message. It was a message directed to the churches that have been brought in union together today. But it could be that you're here today and you're looking at your life and you're thinking, you know, there's not much of my story I'd like to repeat. But if God will take me and if I can live in his story, I'd love to know him. I'd love to know what it means to have my sins forgiven. I'd love to know what it means to have a home in heaven. I'd love to know what it means to never worry about where I'm going to go when I die. If that's you here this morning, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call out your name. But if you have the courage to raise your hand, I'd like to pray for you. If you just raise your hand, that's me. I'd like to know how to be saved. Maybe you're here. And you're thinking to yourself, you know, Pastor, I've made too much of my life about me. I've made too much of it about my story. I want to recommit myself to the story God has for me. Whatever that may be, I'm just glad to serve Him. I'm glad to leave everything behind that I ever made. And I'm glad, I'd be glad to follow Him. Pastor, I'm just asking that God would renew my commitment to serve him. Maybe that's you today. Raise your hands. That's me. That's me. I'm going to take some time to pray before I close. I ask you to do the same and I'll come and conclude in prayer in just a moment. Amen. What a day. Whoa. Good night. You didn't need that from me at all. We've been so full. The blessings the Lord are just flowing from this place. I love the fact that the windows open. Hope the whole town heard us singing. That was amazing. Just amazing. I could just listen to that all day. That was great. Well, there's a couple things that need to take place as, as we close. If you are a guest with us today, and I don't mean from one of the other churches, all right? <clears throat> but if you're from the community and, like, and you're here, I'd, I'd love to know who you are and get a chance to reach out to you. On the bottom of our bulletins, there's a little card you can tear off at the bottom. If you'd leave that with us, that would be great. The announcements are on the bulletin. You can read those on your own time. A few things we'd like to do. Uh, as we dismiss, there is food downstairs uh, for a little bit of after-service reception here. Uh, and there's also going to be food upstairs as well. Uh, so you don't have to all cram downstairs if, if you didn't get some food beforehand. Uh, and uh, please note, there is an outhouse outside, obviously, uh, and it's for the gentlemen, all right? So gentlemen, let's, uh, let the, the restrooms inside, they're, they're multi-purpose, but let's start with the outhouse first, give the ladies uh, space inside, all right? So uh, note that, all right. I'm sure lots of people are going to want to help and clean up, uh, and uh, we can do that here in a minute. I appreciate the help. One, uh, one thing uh, we need to do before we dismiss, though, Pastor Roy, uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, just coming up here. As we were preparing for this service, Pastor Roy said uh, that at the end of this service, he wanted to join because he wanted to be the first from Raging River to join Foundation Baptist before anybody else did. No. And he's been with us. He's, he's gone through uh, all of our membership classes. You're saved and baptized. <laughs> so as we do for our members, I ask the same question the same way to everyone. And this is just for our, our members now. 
Uh, uh, does anyone here, and you better not, but does anyone here have, <laughs> have just cause why Pastor Roy should not be added to the church in membership? Then all those in favor of receiving him in membership, let it be known by good hearty, amen? Amen. 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 Pastor Roy, amen. First member. Uh, amen. I appreciate you being willing to do that. Of course, you got the inside track, so uh, uh, I appreciate that. Now, one final thing as we dismiss. Listen, I don't know. uh, There was one pretty awesome picture out there from way back when. I don't know when. And I don't know when we'll get all these people here once again, so you're going to help me out, okay? Don't run away. We're going to step immediately outside. Rain, shine, doesn't matter. We're going to get a quick picture with everybody in front of the church, and then we'll come back inside. Got it? Everybody good? Get your babies, get your wives. We're going to get outside. We're going to take that picture. You're dismissed.